Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Ornelas. I am the founder of Food Empowerment Project and we made this video to share with you our celebration of 15 years. It's our quinceanera and we're super excited to be celebrating our 15 year anniversary. So just gonna kind of go through some milestones of the past 15 years and I'm gonna take you along with me. I started Food Empowerment Project because I wanted an organization where people felt like they could be their whole selves. I wanted to have an organization where people who looked like me felt comfortable, where people who were part of the organization knew that we cared about them just as much as we cared about the causes that we all fight for on behalf of non-human animals. I wanted to show about veganism and how all these issues are connected to veganism while centering veganism. Talking about how non-human animals are raised and killed for food, which as well as also bringing in other aspects of how animals are abused in our society. And having tools that are created to help everybody keep what it is, their comfort foods, their culture, and not have animal suffering to be a part of it. I also wanted to make sure we talked about farm worker justice and how farm workers who pick our food are also treated and how we can advocate for them. I wanted to make sure we didn't overlook what's happening outside of the United States and we saw about how slavery and child labor is still prevalent in places like Western Africa and Brazil and create a list of vegan chocolates that we could make sure not only didn't harm non-human animals but didn't harm human animals as well. And just as importantly, wanting to take a look at fighting against food apartheid and working on access to healthy foods in black, brown, and indigenous communities to make sure that eating healthy food isn't a privilege, but it's a right. Which also then makes sure that people who want to go vegan have an easier time doing so. And we have vegan Mexican food, vegan Filipino food, and vegan Lao food as a way to show that you don't have to give up your cultural traditions when you go vegan. You can still eat all your delicious comfort foods without the animal suffering. So for vegan Mexican food, we have the website, which is in English and in Spanish, as well as a recipe booklet that you can order. We have vegan Filipino food, which is also on our website and a booklet that is in English and Tagalog. And our newest website is vegan Lao food, which is in English and Lao on our website. And later this year will be a booklet. What's really exciting about all these websites is that the recipes come from chefs, but they also come from home cooks too. So people like maybe even many of you um, who've made your own foods that you grew up with and veganize them. That's what a lot of our recipes have come from, but they all come from people from those cultural backgrounds. So you make sure that they're authentic. I've also been really excited over the past 15 years about how many people like me wanted to make sure that if we were buying something like chocolate, that it didn't include the suffering of human or non-human animals. And so when we created the chocolate list, we had no idea how popular it was gonna be. And just so thankful that so many of you wanna make sure that you eat your ethics and that you're not buying your chocolate from areas where slavery and child labor are the most prevalent. And we've been excited to coordinate events like our Vallejo Healthy Food Fest, which we started to create to really celebrate the community, celebrate the diversity, the amazing organizers that are there, and also the incredible vegan chefs that are from there, where we have had hundreds of people line up for free vegan food all day long. We've had performances, cooking demos, and really just been excited to share veganism um, with the community, learn from them, um, and also just talk about the lack of access to healthy food in the community and the things that they can do and how we can work together to improve it. I was really excited when we started the Fight for the Ocean campaign. Again, this came to me while watching a documentary about how much more we need to do for the oceans. And this goes for vegans and non-vegans alike. So, you know, part of the campaign is really hoping that those people who rightfully get upset when they see animals like sea turtles and dolphins and whales caught in nets, to understand that these nets exist because of their desire to consume animals from the ocean. So that's part of the Fight for the Ocean campaign. And also for those of us who are vegan, who know we're not contributing to the suffering of non-human animals from the ocean, but recognizing or the need to recognize that we need to do more for the oceans. She is in a dire situation and that's why we started the ocean cleanups. So we've been really excited to coordinate ocean cleanups that have gone from just our community to around the world and also cooking demos that we had as part of our fight for the ocean during COVID where we were able to celebrate vegan chefs also from around the world, cooking some delicious meals um, like mac and cheese and lobster, which had no animal cheese and no lobsters, but was vegan. So we've been really excited to try out and share some of these recipes with you. 
Another important part of our work has been our work on lack of access to healthy foods in the communities, black and brown communities, and to fight food apartheid. And we started this work looking at Santa Clara County, which is where we were, where we actually got our start. Um, and taking a look at the community, comparing high income and low income areas for the availability of healthy foods as well as meat and dairy alternatives. And found, which was no surprise, that black and brown as well as lower income communities um, did not have the same access to fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. We also um, were asked by one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party to take a look at it in Vallejo, where we did the same similar surveying. Um, and we also did, with both of these, we did focus groups to hear from the community themselves on what they felt the barriers were, as well as some of the solutions. We've put out a total of four reports, two surveying on the availability of healthy foods, including meat and dairy alternatives, as well as two reports on the serving of the community members. We are currently doing our work in Pittsburgh, California, as asked by the community there. And we're really excited to continue this part of our work, which not only talks about the lack of access to healthy foods, we also have the ability to talk about things like the legacy of colonization and how things such as plant-based milks are not as readily available in these communities as they should be when, if you look at my ancestors who are indigenous to the Americas, you know, Columbus brought the cows over. So truly dairy is part of that legacy of colonization. So it's been really important for us to get the word out and the message about that and to really look at how we can change this. And we've worked on changing this by working with places like Mandela Grocery Cooperative to bring the message of worker-owned cooperatives into communities such as Vallejo, and also really elevating the work of Vallejo People's Garden, who's also trying to get changes made and more healthier foods in the community. And as I mentioned briefly, I was talking about anti-dairy and lactose normal. Wanted to also talk about our newest effort, our anti-dairy campaign, which is really here to show the connections of dairy and how dairy not only involves, like I just talked about, colonization, but also the suffering of non-human animals. Environmental racism, where black and brown community members are more impacted by negative pollutants, as well as how the workers impacted and how all of this is part of of the dairy industry. And so we've done this by this amazing, beautifully um, designed leaflet and also some billboards that we've had put up in Oakland, California and in Madison, Wisconsin that say, got colonization. And again, here, we're just trying to draw people in to look at dairy in a way that possibly they haven't thought of before as a legacy of colonization, but also to bring in things that they maybe have heard of, such as the animal suffering, such as the impacts on the environment. So we've been really excited by our anti-dairy effort. A lot of our work has also included solidarity with farm workers. And we've done this because these are the people who feed us. Of course, not just vegans, they feed everybody unless you grow all your own food. But we really wanted to give back to those who feed us as an organization that advocates for veganism, which is in a sense, advocating for more consumption of fruits and vegetables. We feel we have a responsibility to those workers as well. So we've done things such as our incredible 50 mile regulation that we were successful in getting changed. Not sure how many of you were part of following our organization then, but there was a regulation in California that prevented the children of farm workers from staying in the labor camps when the picking season was over, which meant that many of them did not complete the school year. We were successful in getting that regulation changed. Many of you, and thank you for being a huge part of our school supply drive for the children of farm workers that we have done to help those students be more successful, that we know their parents sacrificed so much for them to have a great education that we wanna do our part in helping them along that way. Because we know many of the changes that we seek in the system, that we try to change, um, are gonna take time. So we wanna figure out a way to immediately help the lives of the farm workers and their children. We support boycotts called by farm workers and we amplify their voices every time that we can. We also participate in protests and hand out literature to support them as well. During COVID, we took on some new challenges. When we talked to the farm workers about what it was that they needed during COVID, ironically and heartbreaking, it was food. So we made sure to have food delivered to the farm workers who feed us. We also make sure that we do other approaches. I mean, we believe in getting to the root of problems and not band-aid approaches, but at the same time, we know that there are instances where everybody needs to pitch in. And we decided to participate and support people in our community when they were hit hard by the fires that happened not too far from our office. Well, also, when we found out that the LGBT community in Vallejo was not receiving a lot of food support because of 
religious organizations not wanting to donate from their food banks, we did a food drive specifically for them. And just don't forget that all of this is vegan food that carries our message along with it. It has also been really amazing to go around the country and in fact around the world to give talks, do tabling events, so that we can meet some of our supporters and we can learn from you as well. But doing those talks has been such a joy. I know it's been cut off a little bit because of COVID and we've become better friends with Zoom, but I'm really looking forward to being able to go back out and meet a lot of you in person. We love tabling and we love recruiting more volunteers to help out with our work. One of the other things I'm excited about is we've always held true to the beginning of our organization and making sure that our website is bilingual. Uh, it's in English and in Spanish, and we've just made sure that it's accessible to as many people as we possibly can. Maybe many of you don't know, but our chocolate list is actually in English, Spanish, German, French, and Portuguese. So it's amazing to see all the support that we get for the chocolate list from around the globe. I know that there's so many people who have had such an impact on Food Empowerment Project, and I just really want to mention how much it means to have people that we truly respect supporting our work and the mission that we do. I know that for a lot of people, it has been a hard adjustment to think of a vegan animal rights organization talking about all these other issues, but these issues are truly connected. And my belief is that more that we work in solidarity together, the bigger impact that we're gonna have for all. And so I'm really grateful for all of you, for all the support that you've given the organization over the years and the years to come. There's so much growth um, that I see that we need to do, more ideas that I have, more amazing staff that have ideas of their own and things that they wanna do. And so I just truly thank you for being on this journey with us. For so many of you, you've seen the seed and we're growing and um, we're getting our roots deeper thanks to you, but we have a lot more blossoming to do. And I just thank you so much for being on this journey and truly supporting the work that we do and that we have still to do in the years to come. We couldn't do this work without you. If you share our stuff on social media, if you donate to us yearly, monthly, whatever it is, all of this is thanks to you. And I just can't thank you enough for believing in the work that we're doing and sticking with us all these years. And I hope you wanna to continue to, to see what we have coming up in the future. Thanks so much.